What's going on, Mounting Seniors? Today is May 12th. I'm looking all raggedy and shaggedy, man. This hair's getting long, beard's getting out of place, sideburns are getting too long. I need to get a haircut. Um, so what this video is going to be for those of you that are watching is going to be just a review of our macro economics unit. Uh, I will be posting a test um, tomorrow. I'll probably have it up for a week uh, for those for you to do it. Can't hurt your grade. It can only help you. Um, so uh, if you turn in the test, I'll grade it. Um, and eventually I'll throw on the answers later, probably next week. So you know, it's there for you if you want to take it and if you want to do it. Um, I just suggest it's worth it. You got nothing else to do. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm going to share the screen um, and we'll go from there. Cool. All right. So we're just going to bust through the study guide real quick. Just quickly go over each one. Um, hopefully this won't take too long, although it looks long. All right, so first off, uh, know the difference between money, the difference between money and currency. Uh, so money is just a medium of exchange, just a form of exchange. Um, this, for example, could be money. This could be money if we said so. This could be money if we said so. Fingernails and hair clippings and skin could be money if we said so. It just depends on what's val what's considered valuable. In the United States, um, what we consider valuable in our medium of exchange, our form of currency is the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is used in the United States. Um, it's probably the most well-known currencies in the world. It's a very valuable currency. Um, <clears throat> but if you go other places, like if you go to Mexico, they have the peso. If you go to Canada, it's the Canadian dollar. If you go to Europe, they use the euro. You go to Australia, they use the Australian dollar. Japan, they use the yen. The Philippines, I think, also uses the peso, um, but their version. Um, so it, it, wherever you go in the world, every country is going to have a different form of currency. Um, and just that's what I want you to know, right? So what we call money in the United States is based off our currency, which is the U.S. dollar. Uh, here's an important one. Understand how loans work, Okay. Loans are pretty simple. Loans are when you either give money or get money, and then you have to pay that money back or you get paid back. So let's just use the example that you borrow money. Let's say it's $100 and you borrow it from the bank because you don't have the $100 on you and you need the $100 for something. So you get the $100 from the bank and they're like, okay, hey, we're gonna charge 3% interest rate on this. The interest, you need to pay us uh, back in a month with the 3% interest. So what that would mean is in a month, you have to pay back not only the $100, but the 3% interest that's tacked on that $100. So 3% interest on $100, right? 3% of 100 is $3. So adding $3 to 100 means you'd have to pay back $103 in total. That's what you'd have to pay back. You're gonna have to take out loans for potentially school, most certainly, if you ever want to buy a house one day, you're going to have to take out a loan and you're going to have to pay that back. So that's how loans work. That's how interest works. Okay. Debt. Debt means simply just when you owe money. Don't overthink it more than that. Oftentimes we hear of debt with credit card debt, student loan debt, um, mortgage debt. Debt can come in a lot of different ways. Um, but just understand it that it um, uh, means money or sorry, it means what you owe, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, next one, know what GDP means, um, gross domestic product. That's usually, it's kind of the most universally recognized ways of uh, understanding um, how healthy an economy is. Um, to figure out how to find GDP, uh, there are four just factors that are involved. So you take um, investments, government spending, um, product, production, things that are made. Um, and then you either add or subtract if there's been net exports or imports. Um, so for example, if the government spends $100 million to build roads, like let's say that's all they built, let's say the government spends $100 million, 
there was a hundred million in investments, like people in the stock market or buying bonds or buying, investing in property. Let's say there's a hundred million in that in your country. Let's say 500 million was what was produced by in, in your country for the whole year by the consumer producers public. So now we're at a total of 700 million. And then let's say you imported a hundred million worth of goods. So you would take 100 million plus a hundred million that gives you two, two plus that 500 million gives you seven. But because you imported a hundred million, that hundred million acts as like a negative. So you take that 700 million, subtract a hundred to be 600 million. If this, if you exported like a hundred million worth of goods, you would add that. So that 700 would become 800 million. Um, hundreds of millions isn't that much for a GDP. Um, the United States, right, is seven, or it's like $20 trillion is the uh, GDP of the United States, I think, are the most recent estimates. So hundreds of millions, it's not super low. Like, you know, I think countries like Tonga were like 50 million, right? That's not a lot. But uh, trillions of dollars um, is, a, is a big jump, okay? So let's see from here. Let's go to difference between real and nominal GDP. Real GDP is adjusted for inflation. Nominal GDP isn't. If we were to look at the GDP of the United States in 1900, it's going to be smaller than the GDP that's going to be 2020. That's just because inflation over time increases the value of goods, how much people are getting paid, et cetera. So it's obviously going to inflate that number. Real GDP is adjusted for inflation, and it gives you a more accurate representation of how a country is doing. So we trust real GDP, not nominal GDP, um, as the better standard, or the true measure of how healthy uh, an economy is. There's also the Gini coefficient, the Human Development Index, the Human Poverty Index. Um, the Gini coefficient measures wealth inequality. The Human Development Index measures um, life expectancy as well as like income levels. And then the Human Poverty Index simply measures how many people are in poverty. There, there are the three other standard ways um, on a macroeconomic scale that we look at uh, countries and how they, how strong they're doing. Um, but the GDP is kind of considered the gold standard. Um, but the other three are also relatively important because they measure other things. Um, understand inflation, how it can happen. And I guess deflation too, as well, fits into that. Um, so inflation happens when there is an increase to the money supply, when there's more money in the money supply. It's like dropping more money in the bucket. Like our bucket is all the money in America. And then all of a sudden, more money gets dropped in. That's going to be inflation. Um, deflation would obviously be the opposite. That means I'm taking money out of the bucket and like burning it and throwing it away. Okay. Typically, on average, um, we get about 3% inflation every year, which isn't a bad thing. Some inflation is good. Inflation kind of represents the growth of an economy. Uh, it represents um, investments. It represents optimism in an economy. Um, so some inflation is okay. And we regularly kind of try to regulate that at about the government about 3% a year. Um, the problem is if you have too much inflation and you have like runaway inflation, like hyperinflation, uh, you're going to have, uh, issues as to like cost of goods. Um, things are going to be so expensive that a lot of people who haven't been a benefited by inflation, which would be a large number in like a hyperinflation scenario, they're not going to have the money for goods, like basic goods, like milk, like toilet paper, things like that. Um, deflation, if you have hyper deflation, that means no one's going to have money to buy really cheap goods. The You could have cheap goods worth super, super low um, and people would be able to buy it once it got to a super low price, but businesses would go out of uh, business would go bankrupt because they're not able to pay off uh, their own uh, workers and their own business investments that they've made. So ultimately what you want to have 3% inflation is kind of considered healthy. Um, you don't really want to have deflation, um, but I mean, it can happen, but ideally 3% inflation is kind of like the magical number that we try to keep it at. 
just know about the uh, the vocabulary for the unemployment uh, vocabulary that we had. So who's in the labor force, who's employed, who's underemployed, yada, yada, yada. What does all that mean? Okay, just go back and read those definitions. I don't need to, you know, they're in the PowerPoint slides. I don't need to read, give you that. Um, actually, I'm also going to put, uh, no, about furloughed, fired, and laid off. No, about, no, what furloughed, fired, and laid off mean. Yeah, you're going to need those three, too, to add that this year. Um, know about frictional, structural, and cyclical employment. Uh, cyclical employment is going to be like patterns of unemployment. So just, you know, seasonal hirings, right? That's a cyclical pattern around Christmas. Like people get hired around the holidays because there's just more of a demand. Um, you have like structural unemployment. That's just going to be like if there's, for example, people who worked at Blockbuster, it when as technology advanced and Netflix took off, like Blockbuster didn't really need to be a thing anymore. So Blockbuster was gone and those people were structurally unemployed. And then frictional unemployment, that's just going to be your standard unemployment that could happen because you get replaced, you get fired. That's more of your standard unemployment. Know about the unemployment rate and how to find it. It's really easy. You just take the amount of people that are in the labor force and the amount of people that are unemployed and you do the math and you have the unemployment rate. So if there's 100 people in the labor force and 10 people are unemployed, that means you have 10% unemployment, right? Obviously, the math gets trickier when you're in the hundreds of millions and you, look, you have to figure out, okay, is this person unemployed? Are they out of the labor force? Are they a discouraged worker? But eventually, you can come to a hard number. Um, we have people in the government that get paid to do the research on that. Um, and then that's how we figure out an unemployment rate. Fun fact, I think our unemployment rate is going to be higher than numbers at the Great Depression. Unemployment rate in the U.S. Can't even see what I'm typing. Where are we at right now? U.S. Give it to me, maybe. Where is it at? Uh, this was four days ago, 14.7%. Um, give me a graph. Google's trying to hide the truth. Um, Let's see if we go to this. Here we are. Boom. 14.7%. That was April of 2020. Um, and this just kind of shows the past like 20 years, right? Went up, went down. That was the Great Recession. That's when we thought it was bad. It was just at 10%. Now we're at 14.7% and we're climbing. Um, gosh, look how steep that graph is too. Kind of crazy. Um, all right. Fiscal policy. Um, there's fiscal policy is just a way the gov. It's it's a term to describe how the government um, is going about their financial business uh, on on the macro scale. How the government is handling money, handling businesses, handling unemployment, different factors of the great macro economy. There's two main types of policies. There's expansionary and contractionary. Expansionary types of fiscal policies are going to be things. Um, as uh, uh, cutting, cutting taxes and increasing government spending. So, um, for example, like if you increase government spending, that's an expansionary policy. If you cut taxes, that's the goal of an expansionary policy, the idea of like, hey, more people are going to have money. Uh, contractionary spending would be slashing government budgets. Um, decreasing right government spending or increasing taxes um, that could be an example of contractionary spending oftentimes these expansionary and contractionary spendings often work against each other for example the democrats want to increase government spending which is an expansionary policy but also they are uh, raising taxes that's going to be cutting away from the civilian public so that's contractionary on like us so oftentimes they kind of work against each other, but it's kind of about where you want to be expansionary. Um, you could uh, cut taxes on the people, but you can't raise government spending because if you cut taxes, there's no way you're going to be able to increase government spending. You're going to have a huge deficit. Um, 
So that's why these two are kind of often at ends, expansionary and contractionary. Uh, know about the budget. Uh, we looked at the budget, just know that we spent a lot of money, like, uh, like trillion, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars um, and our budgets in the trillions usually every year. Um, but we spend hundreds of billions on like the military. We spend tens of billions on education, veterans affairs, healthcare, et cetera. Um, the budget changes every year. It's approved by Congress, ultimately has to be approved by the president. Um, it's kind of like how a bill becomes a law. It's kind of similar in that sense. Um, uh, depending on who's president or who's in power in Congress and the Senate and whatnot, it's going to affect the way the budget looks. Um, I showed you in the video, uh, for those who watch, how Trump uh, has increased like veterans affairs, um, uh, military spending, but it's come at the cost of like cutting like e the EPA's budget, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, or slashing educational uh, budgets and stuff like that. Um, so it kind of depends on who's in power and that's going to affect the way the budget looks. Um, and then if you look at different countries' budgets around the world, that's going to look very different too. Um, so yeah. Uh, know as much about possible, know as much as possible about stocks. Okay, just quick review. The past two videos we had were all about stocks. You can watch that for review. Um, oh, we didn't talk about an IPO, huh? Yeah, because we don't talk about that. I can talk about it now. It's pretty simple. Um, how does the stock market work? Um, okay. Gosh. Companies use the stock market to help grow their business. People use the stock market to kind of gamble their money in hopes of kind of like getting blackjack and hitting 21 and growing their money. Um, to give you an example, let's say, um, let's go back. 30 years ago, when Apple was still a relatively small company, smaller, I mean, not completely small, but smaller, and they were looking to really get an influx of money so they could continue to grow their business. So what they decided to do is they decided to go public and sell a percentage of their company off to the general public. And they're going to sell that not just at 1%, you know, they'll sell it you'll get a fraction of a fraction of a percent. So they'll release 10,000, 20,000 shares. And then people in the general public are fighting over trying to get control of that share because they believe, hey, maybe Apple has a really big future. Again, this was 30 years ago. No one knew the iPhone and Apple was going to be what Apple was. No one knew that. Back then it was like they had colorful like computers and they had Steve Jobs. Like that was kind of what Apple was known for. It was a different time. The point of that is this. Because people fight for those shares, it raises the individual price of those shares. Therefore, it raises the overall value of the company. And then therefore, the company's getting more money, right? When people buy those shares, they get a quick influx of cash. cash. Uh, the most amount of cash they'll get that quickly ever. And uh, they can use that money to invest in their business. Uh, that's also known as an IPO, an initial public offering. That's when a... Um, company goes on the market for the first time so like in the past five years there's been a lot of probably ipos you would know about from uber i think lyft had an ipo airbnb i think has had it um snapchat was a big one um in the past 10 years i think facebook has gone public um twitter etc these other companies have gone public um you know so the ipo is like the first day something's traded um, and that's the goal is hopefully the IPO, you know, does a lot for the business and they get a lot of money and then they can grow their business how they want. Um, so that's kind of how the stock market works. It's pretty much legalized gambling. Uh, you can take your money, invest in a business you think is going to do well. And then um, hopefully you make a return on that. For example, if you went 20 years ago and you had invested in Amazon, when it was only like a dollar to buy it and you had bought like a hundred shares, uh, you would have made a 2000% plus return on that, which means a hundred times 2000 is, let's see, math, 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 a hundred times 2000. You would have made $200,000 by spending roughly a hundred. I mean, you're not going to find deals like that anywhere. That's legalized gambling. 
right? And the best thing is you would have only lost $100, which 20 years ago, adjusted for inflation, it, you know, it's maybe like closer to $180, $200 today, but still it's not that much money in the grand, the grand scheme of things. So people who bought Amazon 20 plus years ago in mass shares, they made their money and they made a good decision. Um, that's kind of why a company goes public too and why would a company go public? Um, why do stocks fluctuate? Uh, it has to do with a variety of factors. Like right now, the stock market over the past two months has drastically gone down. I showed you the graph of why the stock market's gone down. That's because it's coronavirus. Things are shut down. Um, no one's really moving or shipping goods as much as we used to. People aren't going out and buying things because people aren't going out and buying things. Uh, businesses are going under because businesses are going under. That means people are losing their jobs. If people are losing their jobs. They're not getting paid. If people aren't getting paid, they're not buying anything. And so this kind of cycle of like no one spending money is crashing the overall international macro economy. Um, and this one is really bad because this is a pretty unprecedented shutdown. Um, in terms of how developed the world is and how the economy really relies on people buying things. Um, when all of a sudden people can't buy things, it just kind of just shuts down the global stock market and the global economy. So that's why there's so much unemployment and stuff. Um, there's also like news about the company. Um, you know, 20 years ago, Amazon, for example, all they did was just online like books. That's kind of all they were known for. Obviously, the Amazon you know is different than the one I knew as a kid um, because they've really changed the way people consume and buy things. I mean, Amazon is probably the biggest company in the world now. Um, and it's interesting to see how, you know, over time their stocks have fluctuated. Um, there's also like recent news that can affect the uh, a business uh, for um, their stocks. Uh, for example, like when oil prices crashed a couple weeks ago, like that affect like pretty much every gas company in the world. Um, if like when Disney bought like Marvel and like when Disney bought like Star Wars and the rights to those franchises, like the value of Disney went up because, you know, Star Wars and Marvel are huge like entities. Um, uh, trying to think what else uh might be good news unfortunately with coronavirus everything has kind of gone down because of the coronavirus um let's say all of a sudden we found out that apple iphones like definitively cause cancer like the stock of amazon would go down or the stock of apple excuse me would go down um even though they do say these things may cause cancer i don't know but those are some reasons stocks fluctuate um, the Dow Jones, the Dow Jones measures the largest uh, uh, 30 biz, uh, con uh, stocks available for public consumption. Um, it's typically a pretty good measure of uh, how well the economy is doing. Is it 30 or is it 50? I was confused. Dow Jones is 30, yeah. Um, so the Dow Jones is a pretty good measure of that. There's other markets like the NASDAQ. Um, you can buy stocks internationally, like on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. I mean, there's a lot of different markets. There's the Pacific Stock Exchange, just a place where a stock market's done. Uh, Dow Jones is just the well-known uh, a market where you can buy it. The New York Stock Exchange is the kind of building where the Dow Jones trading happens. Uh, it's on Wall Street. It's probably the financial center of the world, um, not only America. Um, we didn't talk about this. Um, and this is one of those things I think that's not in the slides, but we have a lesson on that I would do in class. Bear and bull economy, this is really easy. Um, a bear economy is when things, when there's not a lot of spending, when there's kind of things are slow, when there's not a lot of, you know, um, potential for growth. Um, so a bear economy is um, called a bear economy because we think of bears as like when they hibernate, they're sleepy. So it's like a sleepy economy. I don't know why these animals were picked, but that's just the way it is. Um, then you have a bull economy. A bull economy is when things are aggressive, things are intense, there's a lot more buying going on. There's a bull in front of the New York Stock Exchange. It was a gift by this Italian artist in the 80s when we had a recession. 
Um, it was to encourage spending. And now it's this famous like statue that's in wall that's on like wall street by the New York stock exchange and stuff. Um, so bull economy is like considered like good because people are spending and being aggressive with money. Um, there's also, uh, what we would talk about is like recessions and depressions. Um, but we didn't go over that again. That would have been another thing we would have done in class. Um, but, uh, what we are in right now um, is not just a recession, it's probably like going to be a depression uh, because of the long term effects. It's still unknown. Typically a recession is something it, that takes less than 12 months, like, that, like an economic downturn that lasts less than 12 months is considered a recession. Anything more than that is considered a depression. Um, and chances are, I mean, it's so, it's hard to tell, and I'm not a financial analyst or a medical doctor, and who knows when we'll get a vaccine and stuff, but realistically, until we get a vaccine, people aren't going to be able to go about their normal ways of doing business and living life. So unless that happens in the next 12 months, we're probably head towards depression. Um, but the good news is once a vaccine comes out, we, we could come out of it relatively quick. Um, and even though this will have long lasting effects, um, hopefully there is going to be an end in sight. Um, and hopefully it won't last too long. So cross your fingers. Last couple things, bonds, futures, options, portfolio. Da, da, okay. Bonds. What are bonds? Um, bonds are a safe way to invest. Bonds are uh, an investment that takes a long time to mature at least more than five years. Uh, it's, you're going to get a little return on a bond, but they're safe. They're usually a lot of times they're government backed. Um, so bonds are really safe. It's just a long-term investment. You can look at my last video to go over what exactly a bond is. Futures futures are, you're trying to agree on a price now to either buy or sell something in the future. A lot of times it's used in agriculture. Again, look at my last video for the full description of that options. Options are offered to people, a lot of times at startup companies, when the company's really small and they're trying to save money at the beginning, instead of like getting a salary of $100,000 a year, maybe they're like, hey, Tyler, like instead of getting $100,000, we'll pay you $50,000 and we'll give you like, you know, 0.01% ownership in the company. Now, 0.01% doesn't seem that much, but you look at a company that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars, like Apple or Apple or, or Amazon and stuff, that 0.01% makes you a millionaire. There's a famous story of like all but one person in Apple took the stock or did not take the stock option. That was the only person that never became a millionaire. Um, it's like the famous story. So options are risky, but it kind of depends on your situation. If you can live without the salary, then maybe you take the option. But if you need that cash, then you take the salary. Um, that's what options are. Uh, portfolio, you should diversify. Uh, portfolio is everything you invest in. It could be property, it could be land, it could be commodities like gold, silver, oil, bananas. You can invest in that type of stuff. Um, uh, companies, etc. Um, so portfolio is just what you've invested in and you should diversify because if you put all your money, for example, like in oil, you would have been dead broke like three weeks ago because oil became like a negative in, um, so you should buy like different things and diversify. Um, that way you're just not screwed when one part of the economy goes down. Um, mutual funds and 401ks. A mutual fund is just kind of your standard package of like a, um, like a portfolio that you would get offered that has a wide variety of like safe companies and bonds and mutual funds are kind of how they're offered like sandwiches. I can get different things in the sandwich. Um, but they're still just a sandwich and still you're going to get the same result that like you're going to get fed by the sandwich. Um, some sandwiches are going to do a little better and taste a little better, AKA make you more money. That's a lot of hit and miss. It depends on how much risk you're willing to take on and, and kind of honestly, a lot of luck, but for the most part, mutual funds are, uh, how people retire. Uh, you sign up for a 401k, uh, if you work for a private company, um, you typically hire a money manager, that person invests the money that you give them into a mutual fund, mutual fund grows over a period of 40 years, right? By the time you retire and what start off is maybe your first investment was only a couple hundred dollars. If you keep putting money in it over 
month and month and month or four years, you know, hopefully it's grown to a big pot and you can, you know, if it's over like a million plus dollars by that point, you're going to hopefully be able to retire and such. Um, that's what, that's what mutual funds are. You don't need to have a, like a job in the private sector to even have a mutual fund. If you just have the money, you can go to like TD Ameritrade or E-Trade and go online and do it yourself. Uh, but again, that's like more stress because you have to constantly be on it looking, you have to really understand how markets, stock markets work even better than I do. I would say some people are into that lifestyle and some people really like living that way. I have no problem paying a small fee to someone so they can deal with that stress. And also like, I would feel horrible if I invested in something and lost all my money. So, um, I trust the people that really study it, not me. So that's, uh, that's kind of that last thing here, cryptocurrency. We didn't talk about it. So I'm not even going to ask you about it. Um, it'll be in our last unit. Um, shut down, kind of screwed up this whole unit, but that's the way it is. Um, for those of you that are watching the video, thanks. I'm trying to get YouTube famous on this. Um, I guess I'll stop the share now. Um, if you have any questions, ask me. I will post the test tomorrow. Please stay safe and have a good rest of your day.